17. For those who were here last week, you'll remember that I said last week I would deal with David in a day of worship, and we looked at 2 Samuel 23, whenever those three brave soldiers uh, got into the camp of the Philistines in Bethlehem and got water from the well, brought it back to David, and in an act of worship, he poured it out before the Lord. It was too precious to drink. And I said this week that I would look at David in a day of war. And of course, wars are common to mankind. In this year, uh, at the moment, there's a war in Yemen uh, that's been going since 2011. There's been 377,000 lives lost in Yemen. There's a war in Afghanistan, has been since 1978. An estimated 2 million have lost their lives in Afghanistan. There, there's a war in Myanmar since 1948 with a loss of some 200,000 lives. A war in Ethiopia since 2020, a loss of 500,000 lives. We could talk about the Somali civil war, Syrian war, South, South Sudan, Iraq, the Colombian drug war, the Mexican drug war, Bosnia, Rwanda, I think an estimated 22 wars going on at the moment. And of course, on the 24th of February past, Russia invaded Ukraine. And we watch our television screens as refuge, uh, refugees stream across Europe. The last I saw the figures, it was about 25,000 loss of life and about 10 million people displaced. So we come to a battle. We come to a battle, and in fact, it's David's first conflict, one of the best-known passages in all of our Old Testament. We remember this from Sunday school days. First Samuel 17, starting to read at verse 17. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn, and these ten loaves, and run to the camp of thy to the camp to thy brethren, and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of uh, their thousand, and look how thy brethren fare, and take their pledge. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. 
And David rose up early in the morning and left his sheep with a keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words. And David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, riches and give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth the Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And Eliab, the, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why hast thou come hither? Come down hither. And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? And amen. Let's pray together. Our Father, we have your word open before us, and we know that it is profitable for education, for inspiration, and for devotion. And Father, we pray that as we come to this text, that not only will we come and increase our faith in thee, but that we might grow in our faith of thee and our likeness to thee. And to that end, Bless your word this morning, for Christ's sake. Amen. Well, I said it's familiar words, and you all know the story of David and Goliath. Picture the scene. Goliath stands about 10 foot tall. Verse 4 tells us that he was six cubits in a span, about three meters, so about 10 foot tall. His armor weighed over 10 stone, some 63 and a half kilograms. He had a massive sword. He shouts his defiance over the valley of Elah. Now, this was a brilliant suggestion. I don't know if Goliath came up with it, but somebody came up with a brilliant suggestion because up to this point, the armies were in two sides of a valley the trumpet sounded and they ran towards each other and it was hand-to-hand -hand combat and there was thousands lost their lives. Widows left at home, children with no fathers on both sides. This was a tragedy about to happen. But somebody came up with the idea, no, let's just have one man die. You pick your best, we'll pick our best, we'll meet in the middle, whoever wins, they win the day. This was a brilliant suggestion. And the army of Israel couldn't pick their best. It should have been Saul. He was head and shoulders above all the army in Israel. It should have been Saul saying, man, I will lead by example. I will go. You stand there. I'll fight the giant. But Saul wasn't going. Maybe Eliab should have gone. Strapping big man. He didn't want to go. And at periods of time, this giant of the Philistines, this giant of Gath, Goliath by name, stro stro strode forth from the camp of the Philistines and defied the armies of Israel. And the army of Israel is frightened and embarrassed and nobody wants to fight the giant. 
And as I was thinking of our meeting this morning, you know, this scenario is the same today. Satan's giants intimidate us and frighten us into Cardus. And I could use this text as a sort of springboard. And I could speak about the, the giants of Satan that come to intimidate us. I could talk about the giant of prevailing sin. I could talk about the giant of depression. What a giant that is. I could talk about the giant of doubt and the giant of pain and the giant of bereavement and the giant of pornography and the giant of loneliness and the giant of disobedience and discouragement. The giant of stress, the giant of unemployment. There's hundreds of them. As Satan marches, his giants across our land. I'm going to leave all those giants for another day. This week I want to see how David copes in a day of war. And I want to see if we can see how we can get victory in this present evil age. Notice some things that are familiar in our text, would you please? First of all, notice the accepted apathy. Verse 28, Eliab the eldest heard David uh, David speak unto the men and he was anger was kindled. He says, why did you come down? Uh, you're just coming to, to view the battle. But David, when David turned up in the combat zone of Elah, he heard the taunting of the giant and he was horrified that none of the soldiers of Israel would respond to the challenge. There was a lack of courage. There was an accepted apathy. Nobody was going. Eliab, David's older brother, he said, oh, you're just coming to see the battle. But David's problem was there was no battle to see. Everybody was looking at each other saying, well, who's going to go? I don't want to go. Somebody else will have to go. There was an accepted apathy. Yes, the armies were equipped and ready. Yes, the armies were in the position in the arena of war in the valley of Elah. Yes, they, there was a, an army, an enemy encamped against God's people, but there was no fight. There was no battle. There, there was an accepted apathy. And dear saint of God, is there not a parallel today? We sing about the battle. We talk about the armor for the battle and we would quickly turn to Ephesians chapter 6 and we'd read about the loins girt about with truth and the breastplate of righteousness and the feet shod with the, the gospel and the shield of faith and the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit. All those wonderful. But there's no fighting. We are in spiritual bystanders. We don't want to take up a fight. We sort of shrug our shoulders and say, well, it's a sign of the times. We shrug our shoulders and say, well, sure, the Lord's coming back soon. It was better in my young days. And there's an accepted apathy. As I move from churches to churches now, not in the one pool, but I find that there is a casual attitude to holiness and purity. There's a casual attitude to evangelism. There's a casual attitude to personal devotions. There's a casual attitude to the discipline of prayer. And it seems as if we're just going with the flow. And we see the enemy, but nobody wants to fight. I've often used the illustration, maybe I've used it here, forgive me, I can't remember. But I've often used the illustration of going down to the Belfast docks and there uh, moored in one of the docks is, is the latest cruise ship. 15 stories high. Feet of engineering. Maybe eight or nine restaurants on board and swimming pools. And, and people are arriving to go on the cruise ship. And why? They're, they're so excited. And the big smile on their face. They're looking forward to, to maybe 10 days or two weeks of luxury. Just across the harbour, there's a Royal Navy Type 45 destroyer. And the young people arriving to get on the destroyer with their kit bag over their arm. And their mums and dads are there in tears because they're going out to some of the battle ruined areas of the world. They might not come back. 
they're going out to fight. And the mum and dad are hugging them. And they don't really want to let go and they don't want them to go. Now listen, I have found that most of the problems in the Christian life is this. Most Christians think when they get saved, they're getting on the cruise ship. When all the time they're enlisting for the battleship. That's the problem. We think when we get saved that it's going to sail all the way to glory and we're getting on the cruise ship and we'll have no more problems and no more difficulty when all the time God has enlisted us for the battleship. Now listen, the devil's not worried about Christians on the cruise ship. They're no threat to him. He's very worried about the Christians on the battleship. And I suppose I could say to you this morning in cool rain, which ship are you on? Huh? Which ship are you on? You in the cruise ship? Now, my days of cruising will come. It's called heaven. <laughs> huh? No more problems. No more difficulties. No more sickness. No more illness. Oh, my day of cruising will come. No more difficult. Just a, a life of peace and joy and contentment it'll come but at the moment I'm on the battleship you imagine both those ships come in they're getting off the cruise ship done nothing for God but they arrive at the same port they're in heaven but over across the way, the Type 42 destroyer comes in and there's a band waiting. <laughs> and well done, thou good and faithful sir. And they're coming off and some have got broken arms and they're in sling and maybe some are in crutches and some are struggling. Why? Because they've been in the battle. But there's a, a band to welcome them home because they have won the victory. Which ship are you in? I left the cruise ship. I'm on the battleship. I know that because of the empty tomb, because of the cross, we are on the victory side. I understand that. But we're still fighting against principalities and powers, against spiritual wickedness and high places. And I wonder if in cold rain there's an Eliab here tonight and it's all talk but no fight. There's an accepted apathy. And we sing onward Christian soldiers marching us to war but we don't really mean it anymore. Maybe this week you've been in the battle. Maybe you've been wounded in the battle. Satan's fiery arrows have injured you. My prayer is that you will know the healing touch of the great physician. Even as you tune into the service, even as you sit in the pew, that you will know his touch to heal and restore and strengthen and comfort. He wants to take you up in his arms and say, I know all about it. I was there. I seen it. I know what so-and-so said. I know what so-and-so did. I know what's going on in your body. I know the difficult. I know you're waiting for appointments. I know you can't get the answers. He knows the accepted apathy. Notice something else. Notice the arranged assumption. Verse 38. We didn't read it. I hope your Bible's still open. They take David to Saul. And verse 38. And Saul armed David with his armor and he put a helmet of brass upon his head and he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor and he said to go for he had not proved it and David saith unto Saul I cannot go with these for I have not proved them and David put them off him we have looked at the accepted apathy there's talk of fighting the armies are there but no one is fighting they're scared the arranged assumption nobody wanted to fight and David who had proved God in his childhood by fighting a lion and fighting a bear. You'll find that in verses 34 to 36 of chapter 17. 
He's now ready to face Goliath. Now there's an interesting point there. David proved God privately before he ever was expected to prove him publicly. Isn't that right? There he was on the hillside outside of Bethlehem looking after the sheep and one day a bear arrived and he fought the bear off. I don't know whether he used a sling. I don't know whether he used his hands or a club. But, but he proved God's ability. And he proved God and he said, thank you, Lord. One day there was a lion came. And he knew he was no match for the lion. And a silent prayer went up and David defeated the lion. He proved God in the silent place when nobody was watching, nobody seen. And because he knew his God, because he was convinced of his power, because he knew he was real and, and it wasn't just a figment of his dad's imagination, he was ready to face Goliath. That should always be the order. I meet young fellas and they want to be in a pulpit. And that's a great ambition to have. But they've never proved God in the quiet place. They've never proved God in the secret place. They've never proved God on their own. Before ever they would stand in public. And when they stand in public and the enemy comes in like a flood. They have no roots. They have no foundation. We need to prove God privately before we go public. But notice, notice the erased assumption. Saul wants David to wear his armor. <laughs> you see, across Ulster today, there are many people who don't want to fight. But if I fight, they want me to use their armor. They don't want to fight, but, but they want me to do it their way and they want me to use their armor. And they'll write to me and they'll send me emails and say, Pastor Kennedy, uh, uh, you're going to speak so-and-so, you're going to do this. Here's my advice for you. And you should do it this way and you should do it that way and you shouldn't say this and you should say that. I said, well, why are you not doing it? Seen you're an expert. You use your armor. And God has given me my armor. Saul should have been using this armor. Saul should have been putting on the armor to go out and fight Goliath. But here he is giving it to David. You know what? Why? Because if David won the day, Saul could say, well, you know, he was using my armor, you know. <laughs> like after all, like he had the best armor, that was my armor. And, and Saul would be able to take a wee bit of the credit. You know, he was doing it my way. He was using my armor. He was doing it the way I would have done it. I say this lovingly if you're not prepared to fight be very slow to criticize those that are prepared to fight if you're not prepared to face the enemy be very slow to criticize someone who is prepared to face the enemy they mightn't use your armor they mightn't do it the way you would do it they mightn't have the same tactics, but just pray that God will give them great success in the battle for God. An arranged, sorry, an accepted apathy. Fight, but no fight. All talk. An arranged assumption. Saul wanted David to use his armor when Saul should have been wearing it. It was assumed that he would do it in his way. With his armor and his style. Notice thirdly, not only the accepted apathy, not only the erased assumption, notice the abysmal attitude. People seldom notice this. In fact, I couldn't find any commentary who dealt with this, but I hope you'll notice it. Nobody in the valley of Elah mentions the name of God before David arrives in the scene. Saul never mentions God, Jehovah. Eliab never mentions God, Jehovah. There they are in the middle of the crisis of a battle and they're not mentioning the name of God. 
until David arrived. Abysmal attitude. Eliab, he was, he never mentions God's name. He was worried about the business at home. With whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? How's business going? Who's looking after the, the business? Yeah, that was his concern. Saul, he, he doesn't mention God's name. He's engrossed with the size and the might of the enemy. Look at verse 33. Saul said unto David, Are, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and this is a man of war from his youth. And he's taken up with the size and the breadth and the might of this enemy. It's a tragic thing when God's people in their hour of need lose sight of their heavenly commander. To lose that spiritual vision. Then you're saying of God, I don't know what you're going through, but never lose sight of the one who loved you and died for you. Never lose sight of the one that can draw alongside and meet your need. Today, some will focus on numbers, some will focus on buildings and instruments and worship leaders. And God seems not to come into it. And there's people who want me to go and speak, but they want me to do a wee five-minute epilogue. Or a wee ten-minute thought for the day. They don't want the word. An abysmal attitude. Cometh me in mind for a moment to the Garden of Gethsemane. Judas comes in with the soldiers. He says, the one whom I kiss, that's the one. And he steps forward and he, he kisses the Lord and says, Master. And the army come in. And dear Peter Draws his, you don't often think of the disciples having swords, you don't. But, but Peter drew his sword and cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest, Malchus. The Lord says, put your sword in your sheath, Peter. We well, don't resort to that. Try to view the lash. Watch as Pilate washes his hands. I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Watch the beatings, the cruelty, the man of sorrows. Travel down the Via Della Rosa, the way of the cross, out to that little hill of Calvary. Gaze on the cross and watch as the Savior takes the punishment for your sin and mine. I say to you, keep the cross. Keep the love of God, the sacrifice of Christ central. It's all about Jesus. In 1 Samuel 17, David walks to the brook and gathers five stones. And whenever we have folk in Israel, nothing we do, but we would stop at the Valley of Elah and they'll go out and they'll pick stones off the road, as smooth as they can get, just to remind them. Some of the theologians have a field day when it comes to these five stones. In numerology, the study of numbers in the Bible, five is the number of grace. And so they say that when David went to the brook and lifted the five stones, it was reminding him of the grace of God. Others will say, well, now those five stones represent the five books of Moses. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It speaks of the authority of God's word. Very good. Others will say no. Uh, 2 Samuel 21 tells us that Goliath had four brothers and so David was ready for all five of them. Maybe that's right. Or, or one theologian, he reminds us that it was a lack of faith that David didn't think that God could take him in one attempt and might take five attempts and it was a lack of faith in David's part. One fanciful theologian tells me the name of the five stones. He says the five stones were called courage and confidence, preparation, trust and victory. The Lord bless him. I don't know where he gets that from. All I know is that for over a thousand years, God had those stones in that brook, smoothing them, the water flowing over them, so they would be ready for David when he needed them. 
For me, it reminds me of the sovereignty of God. God is in control. And David, with a simple yet profound trust in God, walks to the battle arena. He directs, swings that sling, and God directs the stone. Goliath falls. David takes his massive sword and cuts his head off. An accepted apathy, an arranged assumption, you have to use my armor, an abysmal attitude, they never mentioned God's name until David arrived. An astounding action, a glorious victory. Men once frightened are frightened and terrified no more. They suddenly move from apathy to victory because of the actions of one young man of God. Young David, never faced an army before, never faced the Philistines before, never maybe seen a giant before, but a young man in the hands of God stepped forward and won the day. An astounding action. One shepherd boy in the hands of God swept in days of revival. Dear friend, could we calculate what we could do harnessed by God? I say to you, today is not the day of petty critics. Today is not the domain of casual bystanders. Stand aside. There's a war on. Souls are dying in sin. Time is fast disappearing. It's time to rescue the perishing. The accepted apathy. Talk of battle, but no battle. The arranged assumption. You've got to wear my armor to do the fight. The abysmal attitude. God's not mentioned. Until David arrives. The astounding action. A glorious victory. Because of one young man. Who was in touch with God. Fifthly. The abiding affection. Turn over to chapter 18. Verse 7. And the woman answered one to another as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very wroth and the saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed unto David ten thousand and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day and forward. The woman attributed the victory to David. And it was his praise that they sang as they played outside. But the reality was, it was God from start to finish. It was God who prepared the heart of David as he shepherded the flock in in Bethlehem. Whenever he sent the bear, sent the lion, he was preparing this young man's heart. It was God that prompted the heart of Jesse to send David to Elah to greet his brothers and bring supplies. It was God who provoked the heart of Saul to let David face the giant. It was God who primed the sling to direct the stone and target. It was God from start to finish. But these foolish women, could not see past the servant. And that misdirected praise almost cost David his life because of Saul's jealousy. We have a tendency, you know, to put those on the platform up on a pedestal. In fact, in the north of Ireland, there are some who like certain preachers and they'll follow them around. They're doing a mission here, we'll go and support them, we'll do a mission. And, and they, in, in their mind, they, they raise the preacher beyond what they should. Please remember, 
The best of preachers is only a sinner saved by grace. Any ability it has is God's doing, not his doing. Any effort he makes, it's God's prompting. All the glory must go to God. This is Sunday school material. I, I'm nearly embarrassed bringing it to you this morning. Sunday school material. You know this from Sunday school days. But, but as we finish, let's get involved in the fight. Be done with the accepted apathy. Talk but no fight. Be careful of the arranged assumption. Don't be wearing somebody else's armour. Wear your own armour. Put on the armour of God so that you can fight. If you have armour you're not using, start to use it. Be aware of the abysmal attitude. God, Jehovah, was forgotten in their moment of crisis. Be thankful for the astounding action. One young man of God brought in revival and be conscious of the abiding affection. Make sure that all glory goes to the Lord for he alone is worthy. May God bless his word to our hearts this morning. We're